Well, thanks to all of you for coming from all parts of the world to address the challenge of change. This is a moment in time, as never before, maybe as never again, when we have an opportunity armed with knowledge that not only did not exist, but could not exist when I was a child. So the young people of today have an edge over all of those who preceded us. Even 500 years ago, when Galileo got into trouble with his, with his colleagues, his friends, his associates, his family even, because he dared to say Earth <laughs> is not the center of the universe. I want to draw your attention to this image. We are the first in all of human history to really know what stars are made of. There's some really intelligent creatures other than humans on Earth. Think of elephants, dolphins, whales, cats, dogs, horses, whatever. They may wonder, what are those shiny things up in the sky? But we have knowledge. There's a lot we don't know about what's up there, but given what was not known before the present time, we should have humility and respect for, for Earth, that little blue speck, mostly blue, as astronauts have noted from high in the sky, unlike our sister planet, the red one, also beautiful, also a speck in that sparkling sky. But it's only now, really, just about this point in history, when we have begun to understand the big issues of who are we, where did we come from, where might we be going, and how might we get to that place that we aspire to reach, sustainable use, perhaps even a modest amount of growth, or a population now seven billion, four times, almost four times, what it was when I arrived. We look at the Earth as if it's ours to use. We are the center of the universe, right? Huh. Well, now we know that we're a part of, not apart from, nature. That everything we care about really depends on showing respect for the natural world. When I was a child, it was thought that the ocean was too big to fail. We could put anything into it, take anything out of it that we wished, and the ocean would continue doing whatever the ocean had done before. But on my watch, on your watch too, consider that on the order of 90% of many of the big fish that we love to consume are already gone. Tunas, cod, swordfish, groupers, you name it, <laughs> they're in trouble. Half the coral reefs have either disappeared or are in a state of sharp decline since the 1980s. Seagrasses, marshes, mangroves, all of them, critical aspects of what an astronaut would look at Earth and say, it's our life support system. We do not make the air that we breathe. That happens as a consequence of photosynthesis, that magical process that was not original on Earth when first formed, but over the years steadily has altered the basic rocks, the basic atmosphere, largely carbon dioxide in the early days, modified the and re relied on the existence of that magical substance, water. 97% of Earth's water is ocean. And it's only right about now, early in the 21st century, as humans measure time, that, or at least as some humans measure time, that we're beginning to appreciate the value of 
that vast blue space that truly dominates the living world. And the ocean, we now know, is alive from the surface to the greatest depths. But it wasn't until 1960 that two people actually went to the deepest part of the ocean, and it's only 11 kilometers down, about the same height that I traveled in the sky, getting here yesterday from the other side of the planet. Technology that now enables us to gain images such as this is cause for hope. Because now we can see, can know, can have the perspective to realize our capacity to alter the nature of nature. So why should we care? If you like to breathe, you'll listen up. Because what we're putting into the atmosphere, carbon dioxide in excess, is changing the chemistry of the ocean. Carbonic acid is being formed out of that carbon dioxide that is excess in the ocean. Change the chemistry of the ocean, you change everything, including the generation of oxygen. One of the things that we now have the capacity with our technologies to measure is that the ocean is now short on oxygen as compared to just 50 years ago. There's a steady decline with acidification, with the depletion of fish, with the other changes that we are imposing on the ocean, on the atmosphere, on the natural world generally. The assets that we rely on to keep us alive, our highest priority must be to keep the world safe so that we can do all the other things that we care about. And what do you care about? Your health, the economy, prosperity, the next generation. I can look back over decades, decades that have marked the most rapid time of learning in all of human history. We've learned more about the ocean, about who we are, about the universe beyond, but we've also lost more. It has cost us so much in terms of drawing down the natural assets to get to where we are, but the good news is now we know. The great news is, in spite of the worries about seven billion people and seven billion appetites, seven billion people to clothe and feed, have space, have room and a, an opportunity to realize their own dreams for the future, there are also seven billion minds, minds that are now connected in ways that could not have happened 50 years ago or even five years ago. The pace is picking up. It's like a race. Can we learn enough soon enough and act upon that knowledge to realize that we really must take care of the systems that take care of us, that the most important thing we extract from the ocean is our existence, the most important thing we extract from nature. So what can we do about it? A hundred years ago, nations around the world began to wake up to the losses on the land, wake up to the importance of protecting forests, deserts, wildlife. It's only fairly recently, like only last June, that the United Nations had a focused meeting on the ocean. It was only with the Paris negotiations about climate that the ocean finally got onto the balance sheet. We are so terrestrial in our orientation, even here in this beautiful desert country. Huh. There is a lot of ocean that borders the desert that is still largely unknown, unexplored, like most of the ocean around the world. Only about 10% has been mapped with the same degree of accuracy that we have for the moon, for Mars, for Jupiter. <laughs> what are we thinking? Now we have a chance. And this group of young minds and seasoned experts gathered together can make a difference. If not now, what are we waiting for to really explore the natural world, explore the ocean? In the 1960s, we began to seriously look skyward. 
in ways that were not possible before. The first astronauts looked back and saw Earth with new eyes. There's a new generation looking in the other direction, but the technologies to go deep in the sea are lagging far behind. Exploitation is moving rapidly. Exploration very slowly. So one of the things that I would like to suggest as a challenge to you is to think about what each of us can do with everyday decisions and collectively as well to take into account the importance of the natural world, the mandate that we have now to explore, to get to know the ocean, to appreciate the value of the living assets that make everything else that we care about possible. Thank you.